Introduction to Data Communication In this video, we are going to see about Introduction to Data Communication. Basically, data communication is the exchange of data between a source and a receiver. The device that transmits the data is known as the source and the device that receives the transmitted data is known as a receiver. Data communication aims at the transfer of data and maintenance of data during the process, but not the actual generation of the information at the source and receiver. A data communication system may collect data from remote locations through data transmission circuits, then outputs processed results to remote locations. Data communication jargons to contend with such as baud rate, modems, routers, LAN, WAN, TCP IP, ISDN during the selection of communication systems. Hence, it becomes necessary to review and understand these terms and gradual development of data communication methods. Communication Systems In this video, we are going to see about communication systems. Since the beginning of time of the human race, the need to communicate led to the development of different techniques and methods based on circumstances and available technology. Many early forms of communication were gestures, writing, and depicted on cave walls, etc. In 1948, Claude Shannon, who worked for the Bell Telephone Company in the United States of America, had proposed a model of communication. A data communication system is a computer system that collects data from remote locations through data transmission circuits, then output processed data to remote locations. These are two types of data transmission methods that are used to transmit data from its origin to the information processing. These are offline, online, communication software. Communication software is generally embedded in the computer operating system. The role of communication software is to assist the operating system in managing local and remote terminal access to host resources, to manage security and to perform certain checkpoint activities. The components of data communication system with devices as DTE, DCE and medium. DTE DCE and medium as depicted in figure have been replaced by computer with communication software, modem that is a modulator and demodulator and telephone line respectively. Signal and data. In this video we are going to see about signal and data. 
data communication and networks deal with data or information transmission. There are two ways to communicate, display, store or manipulate information. They are referred to as analog, digital. In the analog form of electronic communications, information is represented as a continuous electromagnetic waveform. Digital communications represents information in binary form through a series of discrete pulses. Analog Analogous variations in electrical or radio waves are created in order to transmit the analog information signal for video or audio or both over the network from a transmitter that is TV station or CATV source to a receiver that is TV set, computer connected with antenna. At the receiving end, an approximation analog of the original information is presented. Information which is analog in its native form, audio and image, can vary continuously in terms of intensity, volume or brightness, and frequency, tone or color. The carrier signal is modulated in order to create an analog of the original information stream. The electromagnetic sinusoidal waveform or sine wave can be varied in amplitude at a fixed frequency using amplitude modulation that is AM. Alternatively, the frequency of the sine wave can be varied at constant amplitude using frequency modulation that is FM. Additionally, both frequency and amplitude can be modulated simultaneously. Digital Computers are digital in nature. Computers process, store and communicate information in binary form that is in the combination of ones and zeros which has a specific meaning in computer language. A binary digit that is bit is an individual one or zero. Computer systems communicate in binary mode through variations in electrical voltage. Digital signaling in an electrical network involves a signal which varies in voltage to represent one of two discrete and well-defined states as depicted either a positive voltage and a nil or zero voltage that is unipolar or a positive or a negative voltage that is bipolar. Transmission modes. In this video we are going to see about transmission modes. Transmission modes. Data transmission can occur in any of the three modes. Simplex mode, half duplex mode, full duplex mode. Simplex mode. In this mode of data transmission, data is transferred only in one direction. In this mode, the device can either send or receive the data. Simplex transmission is not often used because it is not possible to send back error or control signals to the transmit end. For example, when a person is giving a lecture or speech, information is primarily conveyed in one direction. The other examples are TVs and radios. Half duplex mode. In this mode, data can be transmitted back to and fro between the two, but the data can go only in one direction at any point of time. 
In addition, it is possible to perform error detection and request the sender to retransmit information that arrived corrupted. For example, internet surfing is half duplex as a user issues a request for a web document, then that document is downloaded and displayed before the user issues another request. Full duplex mode In this mode, data can be transmitted in both the directions simultaneously. This mode is fast as it avoids the delay caused by half duplex circuit each time. Of course, in the world of data communications, full duplex allows both way communication simultaneously. An example can be a consumer which uses a cable connection not only receives TV channels but also the same cable to support their phone and internet surfing. Synchronous and Asynchronous Transmission In this video, we are going to see about Synchronous and Asynchronous Transmission. Synchronous Transmission Synchronous is the method of data transmission in which data, that is blocks of characters, are transferred in a clock cycle. Each block of characters is marked with synchronization characters. The receiving device receives the data until the synchronization character or the special ending character is detected. As soon as it is received, data transmission is stopped. Synchronous transmission has the advantage that the timing information is accurately aligned to the received data, allowing operation at much higher data rates. In it, both transmitter and receiver operates at the same clock cycle, so the timing errors are reduced. It also has the advantage that the receiver tracks any clock drift which may arise for instance due to temperature variation. Another advantage is that it can perform error detection as they operate on the same clock cycle so the CRC that is cyclic redundancy checks are performed on the blocks of data both on the sending side and the receiving side. The major disadvantage is that a more complex interface design is needed and potentially a more difficult interface to configure. Asynchronous Transmission Asynchronous transmission is the method of data transmission in which one character is transmitted at a time. Each character is surrounded by start and stop bits. Receiving data on a character by character basis must also synchronize the receiving side. Asynchronous is used for voice band and broadband, but the synchronous is used for low speed bands. The strings made up are small, so timing errors or the start of the next frame will not mistake the receiving side. The start and stop bits indicate the beginning and end of the data stream. For example, a telephone conversation is asynchronous because both parties can talk whenever they like. If the communication were synchronous, each party would be required to wait a specified interval before speaking. Circuit, Channel and Multi-Channeling in this video, we are going to see about circuit, channel and multi-channeling. A circuit is a path between two or more points along which an electric current flows. In data communication, we may consider a circuit as a specific path between two or more points along which the signals can be carried. The signals may be analog, binary or digital. 
the link between PC and modem, link between modem and CTO and so on constitute a circuit. The circuit may be a physical path consisting of one or more wires. It may also be wireless. A network which may be wired or wireless is an arrangement of circuits consisting of a number of intermediate switches. The circuit may be defined as virtual circuit that is VC based upon the type and nature of the connection. A virtual circuit may be defined as logical path between two or more points. However, the connection is not guaranteed. Therefore, it seems like a fixed physical path. Permanent virtual circuit that is PVC. A permanent connection is ensured using permanent virtual circuit that is PVC which provides a guaranteed connection between the two or more points when needed without having to reserve or commit to a specific physical path in advance. Switched Virtual Circuit that is SVC A switched virtual circuit that is SVC is similar to a permanent virtual circuit but allows user to dial into the network of virtual circuits. Communication between the two CTOs takes place in digital transmission mode and therefore constitutes a channel of 64 kHz bandwidth. Similarly, communication between modem and CTO takes place on analog channel of 4 kHz bandwidth. In case of Integrated Services Digital Network that is ISDN, basic grid interface that is BRA service is supporting three multiplexed channels. These are divided in two service channels at 64 kbps each and a 16 kbps signaling channel. These numbers of channels on a single circuit are possible because of multiplexing techniques. Signaling In this video, we are going to see about signaling. The telephone network at its beginning used a circuit switch network with the dedicated links that is multiplexing had not yet been invented to transfer voice communication. A circuit switched network needs to set up and tear down faces to establish and terminate paths between the two communicating parties. In the beginning, this task was performed by human operators. The operator room was a center to which all subscribers were connected. A subscriber who wished to talk to another subscriber picked up the receiver, that is half hook, and rang the operator. The operator, after listening to the caller and getting the identifier of the called party, connected the two by using a wire with two plugs inserted into the corresponding two jacks. A dedicated circuit was created in this way. One of the parties, after the conversation ended, informed the operator to disconnect the circuit. This type of signaling is called in-band signaling because the same circuit can be used for both signaling and voice communication. Both in-band and out-of-band signaling were used. In in-band signaling, the 4 kHz voice channel was also used to provide signaling. In out-of-band signaling, a portion of the voice channel bandwidth was used for signaling. The voice bandwidth and the signaling bandwidth were separate.
As telephone networks evolved into a complex network, the functionality of the signaling system increased. The signaling system was required to perform other tasks such as providing dial tone, ring tone and busy tone. Transferring telephone numbers between offices. Maintaining and monitoring the call. Keeping billing information. Maintaining and monitoring the status of the telephone network equipment. Providing other functions such as caller ID, voicemail and so on. Signaling Network The signaling network is a packet switch network involving layers similar to those in the OSI model or Internet model. A simplified situation of a telephone network in which the two networks are separated. Signaling System 7 that is SS7 the protocol that is used in the signaling network is called signaling system 7 that is SS7. It is very similar to the five layer internet model but the layers have different names. Physical layer, MTP level 1, data link layer, MTP level 2, network layer, MTP Level 3 Transport Layer SCCP Upper Layers TUP, TCAP and ISUP ISDN User Port that is ISUP can replace TUP to provide services similar to those of an ISDN network. Encoding and Decoding In this video, we are going to see about Encoding and Decoding. Encoding and Decoding In order to transport digital bits of data across carrier waves, encoding techniques have been developed, each with their own merits and demerits. Types of data encoding are Digital Data Digital Signal Digital Data Analog Signal Analog Data Analog Signal Analog Data Digital Signal Digital Data Digital Signal Digital Signal is a sequence of discrete discontinuous voltage pulses. Data is represented in binary. These binary data is transmitted by encoding each data bit into signal elements. Line coding is the method used for converting a binary information sequence into a digital signal in a digital communication system. Selection of line coding technique depends upon the type of consideration. The complexity and the cost of the line code implementations are always factors in the selection for the given application. The bit stream to be transmitted is encoded so that binary 1 is represented by a positive pulse and binary 0 by a negative pulse. This is known as bipolar encoding. Each bit cell in the bipolar encoded signal contains docking information. Digital data analog signals. Digital data is transmitted using analog signal through the public telephone network. The telephone network was designed to receive, switch and transmit analog signals in the voice frequency range of about 300 to 3400 Hz. Modems are used for telephone network that produce signals in the voice frequency range. 
Three types of encoding techniques are used for converting the digital data into analog signals. These are Amplitude shift keying that is ASK Frequency shift keying that is FSK Phase shift keying that is PSK Analog data digital signals Analog data is converted into digital data and then it is suitable for transmission. The digital data can be transmitted using NRZL. The digital data can be encoded as a digital signal using a code. Last one is the digital data can be converted into an analog signal. Codec device is used for converting analog data into digital form for transmission and again converting into original to an analog ASK signal. Codec uses two techniques. They are pulse code modulation, delta modulation techniques, analog data analog signals. Analog data in electrical form can be transmitted as baseband signals easily and cheaply. Modulation is a process which combines an input signal M of T and a carrier at frequency FC to produce a signal S of T whose bandwidth is centered on FC. Amplitude modulation, frequency modulation and phase modulation techniques are used for transmitting analog signals. Amplitude modulation is expressed as S of t is equal to 1 plus n a x of t into cos 2 pi f c t. Where cos 2 pi f c t is a carrier and x of t is input signal. n a is modulation index. Error detection. In this video we are going to see about error detection. Error means a condition when output information is not same as input information. Four types of redundancy checks are used in data communication. Vertical redundancy check that is VRC. Longitudinal redundancy check that is LRC. Cyclic redundancy check that is CRC. Check sum. Vertical redundancy check that is VRC. The most common and least expensive mechanism for error detection. In this technique, a redundant bit called a parity bit is appended to every data unit. There are two types of parity bits used. Even parity, odd parity. Even parity. Even parity means the number of ones in the given word including the parity bit should be even, that is 2, 4, 6, and so on. Odd parity. Odd parity means the number of ones in the given word including the parity bit should be odd, that is 1, 3, 5, and so on. Use of parity bit. The parity bit can be set to 0 and 1 depending on the type of the parity required. For even parity, this bit is set to 1 or 0 such that the number of 1 bits in the entire word is even. For odd parity, this bit is set to 1 or 0 such that the number of 1 bits in the entire word is odd. Append a single bit at the end of data block such that the number of 1s is even. VRC is also known as parity check. Longitudinal redundancy check that is LRC. 
In longitudinal redundancy check, a block of bits is divided into row and redundant row of bits is added to a whole block. Organize data into a table and create a parity for each column. Then, attach 8 parity to the original data and send them to the receiver. At the receiving end, the receiver checks LRC using same method. Some of the bits do not follow the even parity rule and the whole block is discarded. Cyclic redundancy check that is CRC. Cyclic redundancy check CRC is the most powerful method for error detection. A sequence of redundant bits called the CRC or the CRC reminder is appended to the end of a data unit. There are three basic steps used. A string of n zeros is appended to the data unit. The number n is one less than the number of bits in the predetermined divisor which is n plus 1 bits. The newly elongated data unit is divided by a divisor using a process called a binary division. The reminder resulting from this division is the CRC. The CRC of n bits is derived in step 2 replaces the appended zeros at the end of the data unit. At its destination, the incoming data unit is divided by the same divisor. If there is no reminder, the data unit is accepted is rejected. Error correction. In this video, we are going to see about error correction. Error correction is handled by two ways. Single bit error correction. Burst error correction. Single bit error correction. Let us take an ASCII character of 7 bits. The situations occur may be no error, error in first bit, error in second bit, and so on up to error in seventh bit. Redundancy bit. At first glance, we would need three redundant bits to perform correction of seven bit ASCII characters because three bits can show eight different states. However, errors can affect the redundant bits too. Number of redundant bits R should be chosen in such a way that all single bit errors and these are M plus R plus 1 ones can be corrected. Since R bits can have 2 power R different states, a sufficient condition is 2 power R is greater than or equal to M plus R plus 1. For example, for ASCII code M is equal to 7, the smallest value of R is 4. 16 is equal to 24 is greater than or equal to 7 plus 4 plus 1 which is equal to 12. Hamming code Place the redundant bits that is R bits in different positions. Each R bit is a parity bit or VRC bit for a subset of the entire data. Receiver checks the parity bit again and can identify the bit in error, if any. Placement of the R bits for ASCII characters R bits are placed in positions which are power of 2. Check bit R1 covers all odd numbered bits, for example, 1, 3, 5 and so on. Check bit R2 covers bits 2, 3, 6, 7, 10, 11. 
check bit R4 covers bits 4, 5, 6, 7. Check bit R8 covers bits 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. Calculating the values of the R bits on the sender side. In the first step, we place each bit of the original character in its appropriate position in the 11 units. In the subsequent step, we calculate the even parities for the various bit combinations. The parity value for each combination is the value of the corresponding orbit. For example, the value of R1 is calculated to provide even parity for a combination of bits 3, 5, 7, 9 and 11. The value of R2 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 3, 6, 7, 10 and 11. The value of R4 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 4, 5, 6 and 7. The value of R8 is calculated to provide even parity with bits 8, 9, 10 and 11. Flow control in this video, we are going to see about flow control. A flow control is a set of procedures that tells the sender how much data it can transmit before it must wait for an acknowledgement from the receiver. The flow of data must not be allowed to overwhelm the receiver. Any receiving device has a limited speed at which it can process incoming data and a limited amount of memory in which to store incoming data. The receiving device must be able to inform the sending device before those limits are reached and to request that the transmitting device send fewer frames or stop temporarily. Two types of mechanism can be deployed in the scenario to control the flow. Stop and wait. Sliding window. Stop and wait. In a stop and wait method of flow control, the sender waits for an acknowledgement after every frames it sends. In the stop and wait method of flow control, the sender sends one frame and waits for an acknowledgement before sending the next frame. This process of alternately sending and waiting repeats until the sender transmits an end of transmission frame. The advantage of stop and wait is simplicity. Each frame is checked and acknowledged before the next frame is sent. The disadvantage is inefficiency. The stop and wait is slow. Sliding window In the sliding window method of flow control, the sender can transmit several frames before needing an acknowledgement. Frames can be sent one right after another. The receiver acknowledges only some of the frames using a single acknowledgement to confirm the receipt of multiple data frames. The window can hold frames at either end and provides an upper limit on the number of frames that can be transmitted before requiring an acknowledgement. Frames may be acknowledged at any point without waiting for the window to fill up and may be transmitted as long as the window is not yet full. To keep track of which frames have been transmitted and which is received, sliding window introduces the identification scheme based on the size of the window.
the frames are numbered modulo n, which means they are numbered from 0 to n minus 1. For example, if n is equal to 8, the frames are numbered 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 0, 1, and so on. The window is n minus 1. When the receiver sends an acknowledgement, it includes the number of the next frame it accepts to receive. In other words, to acknowledge the receipt of a string of frames ending in frame 4, the receiver sends an acknowledgement containing the number 5. Send a window. At the beginning of the transmission, the sender's window contains n minus 1 frames. As frames are sent out, the left boundary of the window moves inwards, shrinking the size of the window. Given the window of the size W, if three frames have been transmitted since the last acknowledgement, then the number of frames left in the window is W minus 3. Once an acknowledgement arrives, the window expands to allow a number of new frames equal to the number of frames acknowledged by that acknowledgement. Receiver window At the beginning of transmission, the receiver window contains not n-1 frames but n-1 spaces for frames. As new frames come in the size of the receiver window shrinks, given a window size of W, if three frames are received without an acknowledgement being returned, the number of spaces in the window is W-3. As soon as an acknowledgement is sent, the window expands to include places for a number of frames equal to the number of frames acknowledged. Conceptually, the sliding window of the receiver shrinks from the left when frames of data are received. The sliding window of the receiver expands to the right when acts are sent. Condition Management In this video, we are going to see about Condition Management. Condition Management Flow control is aimed at preventing a fast sender from overwhelming a slow receiver and although it can be helpful at reducing condition, it can't really solve the condition problem. Pre-allocation is one way to help prevent condition. Pre-allocation schemes try to prevent condition from happening by requiring that resources be pre-allocated before any data can be sent, guaranteeing that the resources will be available to process the data when it is received. Condition collapse can occur when the network becomes so overloaded that very few data packets reach their destination and in the meantime the sending hosts continue to generate more and more data in the form of retransmissions and new data. The level of condition can be estimated by measuring such factors as the percentage of buffers in use and line utilization. Traffic shaping Traffic shaping is a term given to a range of techniques designed to prioritize the transmission of data over a network link. Traffic shaping involves regulating the flow of data across the network. The main idea behind shaping is to change bursts of traffic to uniform, regular traffic. For communication to occur, the sender and carrier negotiate 
a traffic pattern or shape allowing specific policies to be set that alter the way in which data is queued for transmission. Load Shedding Load shedding is the process of systematically reducing the system demand by temporarily decreasing the load in response to transmission or capacity shortages. Sometimes there simply may be too much traffic to be able to get it all through. The packets are lost forever if the stream was unacknowledged. However, if the stream has some form of control, a retransmission can be tried at a later time. A router needs to decide how to choose which packets to drop. If the router knows something about the traffic, it might be possible to make intelligent choices, otherwise packets are picked at random. Jitter control Jitter is deviation in the pulses in a high-frequency digital signal. The deviation can be in terms of amplitude, timing or the width of the signal pulse. It is the variation in the time between packets arriving due to network congestion, timing drift or route changes. Among the causes of jitter or electromagnetic interference that is EMI and crosstalk with other signals. The task of jitter control is to make sure that traffic gets through the network smoothly. One mechanism of doing this is to compute the expected transit time for each hop that is router along the path. This information is carried in packets. If at a hop the packet is behind schedule, the router can increase the priority and send it faster. If a packet is ahead of schedule, it can decrease the priority and send it later. The amount of allowable jitter depends greatly on the application. Concept of Multiplexing In this video, we are going to see about concept of multiplexing. Concept of Multiplexing Multiplexing is a technique by which different analog and digital streams of transmission can be simultaneously processed over a shared link. Multiplexing divides the high capacity medium into a low capacity logical medium which is then shared by different streams. Communication is possible over the air that is radio frequency using a physical media that is cable and light that is optical fiber. When more than one sender tries to send over single medium, a device called multiplexer divides a physical channel and allocates one to each. On the other end of communication, a demultiplexer receives data from a single medium and identifies each and sent to different receivers. Multiplexing FDM, TDM, CDM, WDM In this video, we are going to see about multiplexing FDM, TDM, CDM, WDM Various types of multiplexing Frequency division multiplexing Time division multiplexing Code division multiplexing Wavelength division multiplexing Frequency division multiplexing that is FDM Frequency division multiplexing that is FDM is an analog technique that can be applied when the bandwidth of a link in Hertz is greater than the combined bandwidths of the signals to be transmitted. 
In FDM, signals generated by each sending device modulate different carrier frequencies. FDM divides the spectrum or carrier bandwidth in logical channels and allocates one user to each channel. Each user can use the channel frequency independently and has exclusive access to it. All channels are divided in such a way that they do not overlap with each other. Channels are separated by God bands. Time division multiplexing that is TDM. TDM is applied primarily on digital signals but can be applied on analog signals as well. In TDM, the shared channel is divided among its user by means of time slot. Each user can transmit data within the provided time slot only. Digital signals are divided in frames equivalent to time slot, that is, frame of an optimal size which can be transmitted in a given time slot. TDM works in synchronized mode. Both ends, that is, multiplexer and demultiplexer, are timely synchronized and both switch to next channel simultaneously. When at one side channel A is transmitting its frame on the other end, demultiplexer providing media to channel A. As soon as its channel A's time slot expires, this side switches to channel B. On the other end, demultiplexer behaves in a synchronized manner and provides media to channel B. Signals from different channels travels the path in an interleaved manner. Multiple signals can be transmitted if each signal is allowed to be transmitted for a definite amount of time. These time slots are so small that all transmissions appear to be in parallel. Synchronous TDM Time slots are pre-assigned and are fixed. Each source is given its time slot at every turn due to it. This in turn may be once per cycle or several turns per cycle if it has a high data transfer rate or maybe once in a number of cycles if it is slow. This slot is given even if the source is not ready with data. So the slot is transmitted empty. Asynchronous TDM in this method, slots are not fixed. They are allotted dynamically depending on speed of sources and whether they are ready for transmission. Code division multiplexing that is CDM. Multiple data signals can be transmitted over a single frequency by using code division multiplexing. FDM divides the frequency in smaller channels, but CDM allows its users to full bandwidth and transmit signals all the time using a unique code. CDM uses orthogonal codes to spread signals. Each station is assigned with a unique code called CHIP. CDM is widely used in so-called second generation that is 2G and third generation that is 3G wireless communications. The technology is used in ultra high frequency that is UHF cellular telephone systems in the 800 MHz and 1.9 GHz bands. This is a combination of analog to digital conversion and spread spectrum technology.
CDM may be defined as a form of multiplexing where the transmitter encodes the signal using a pseudo random sequence. CDM involves the original digital signal with the spreading code. On the other hand, the receiver knows about the code generated and transmitted by the transmitter and therefore can decode the received signal. Code division multiplexing assigns each channel its own code to make them separate from each other. All channels CI use the same frequency at the same time for transmission. These numbers of different frequencies per bit are called as the chip rate. If one or more bits are transmitted at the same frequency, it is called as frequency hopping. This will happen only when the chip rate is less than 1 because the chip rate is the ratio of frequency and bit. At the receiving side, the receiver decodes a 0 or a 1 bit by checking these frequencies in the correct order. Wavelength Division Multiplexing that is WDM Wavelength Division Multiplexing that is WDM is designed to use the high data rate capability of fiber optic cable. The optical fiber data rate is higher than the data rate of metallic transmission cable. Using a fiber optic cable for one single line weighs the available bandwidth. Multiplexing allows us to combine several lines into one. Light has a different wavelength to this colors. In fiber optic mode, multiple optical carrier signals are multiplexed into an optical fiber by using different wavelengths. This is an analog multiplexing technique and is done conceptually in the same manner as FDM but uses light as signals. Spread Spectrum Transmission System In this video, we are going to see about Spread Spectrum Transmission System. Spread Spectrum Transmission System Spread Spectrum techniques were originally developed for military applications to counter jamming and unauthorized detection of wireless signals. In spread spectrum techniques, the information signal is spread over a wider bandwidth at the transmitter. Bandwidth spreading is done using a pseudo-random binary sequence that is PRBS called spreading sequence. At the receiver, the spreading sequence is used again to restore the information signal. The spreading sequence at the receiver compacts the transmitted signal but it spreads the interference and thus reducing its impact. Spreading DS FH In this video we are going to see about spreading DS FH. There are two basic spread spectrum techniques direct sequence spread spectrum that is DSSS, frequency hopping spread spectrum that is FHSS, direct sequence spread spectrum that is DSSS. In direct sequence spread spectrum that is DSSS, each data bit is represented by multiple bits in the transmitted signal. The original signal therefore spreads across a wider frequency band in proportion to the number of bits used to represent one data bit. 
The data bits are exclusive odd with a spreading sequence which is a pseudo random binary sequence that is PRBS. The spreading sequence has a much higher bit rate than the data bits. 7 bit spreading sequence 1110010 is used. Note that for each data bit, 7 bits are transmitted. Thus, the bandwidth of the transmitted signal expands to 7 times. At the receiving end, the received sequence is again exclusive odd with the spreading sequence to get the data bits. Note that we need at the receiver spreading sequence which is synchronized with data bit boundaries in addition to being clock synchronous. One bit of the spreading sequence is called a chip. Thus, chipping rate is the bit rate of the spreading sequence. The ratio of chipping rate and data rate expressed in decibels is referred to as processing gain. Frequency hopping spread spectrum that is FHSS. In frequency hopping spread spectrum that is FHSS, the transmitted carrier frequency is changed randomly at fixed intervals. The message signal modulates the carrier which is at F1 to start with. After a fixed interval TC, the carrier frequency changes to hand F7, then to F5 and so on. The receiver is synchronized to the transmitter. It picks up the transmitted carrier frequency to retrieve the information signal by demodulating it. At the transmitter, the data signal modulates the IF that is intermediate frequency using FSK or PSK. The modulated IF is upconverted to RF that is radio frequency carrier using a frequency synthesizer. The frequency synthesizer is driven by a PRBS so that the RF is hopped randomly. At the receiver, the received RF is downconverted the IF using a local frequency synthesizer that is driven by the same PRBS synchronized to the PRBS of the transmitter. The IF is demodulated to get back the data signal. If the hopping rate is equal to 1 by TC is greater than the baud rate that is the modulation rate, we call it as the case of fast frequency hopping spread spectrum. If the hopping rate is less than the baud rate, we refer it to as the case of slow frequency hopping spread spectrum. The two state FSK modulation is used, thus each symbol contains one bit. The higher frequency represents binary 1 and the lower frequency represents binary 0. Concepts of modulations In this video, we are going to see about concepts of modulation. Modulation is the act of translating low frequency that is base band signal such as voice, music and data to a higher frequency. Modulation demodulation is a non-linear process where two different sinusoids are multiplied. 
Let us assume the two sinusoids FM and FC as baseband signal and carrier respectively and are represented as FM is equal to A sin omega MT plus phi 1 and FC is equal to B sin omega CT plus phi 2. Amplitude modulation The modulation index is numerically equal to the phase deviation in radians. Amplitude modulation that is AM involves the modulation of the amplitude of the carrier as analog sine wave as FC. When combined, the resultant AM signal consists of the carrier frequency plus upper and lower side bands. This is also known as double side band amplitude modulation that is DSB AM or more commonly referred to as AM. The carrier frequency may be suppressed or transmitted at a relatively low level. Amplitude modulation is rarely used individually as it is highly sensitive to impacts of attenuation and line noise. The modulating index is given as M is equal to E maximum minus E by EC. We may derive the following equation for modulating index M. M is equal to E maximum minus E minimum by E maximum plus E minimum. Angle modulation Angle modulation FC is equal to B sin omega C plus phi 2. In the equation, there is an argument of sine as omega ct plus phi 2 which can be varied in accordance with the equation and thus producing either frequency or phase modulation. In either case, the amplitude of the carrier remains unchanged with incremental change in omega ct plus phi 2. Frequency modulation Frequency modulation involves the modulation of the frequency of the analog sine wave as shown. Where the instantaneous frequency of the carrier is deviated in proportion to the deviation of the modulated carrier with respect to the frequency of the instantaneous amplitude of the modulating signal. Unlike AM, the amplitude of the carrier signal is unchanged in FM. Power output is also constant differing from the varying AM power output. The modulating index for FM is given as below. Beta is equal to FP by FM where beta is the modulation index, FM is the frequency of the modulating signal and FP is the peak frequency deviation. Phase modulation Phase modulation that is PM is similar to frequency modulation. In FM the frequency of the carrier wave changes whereas in PM the phase of the carrier wave changes. In PM the phase of the carrier is made proportional to the instantaneous amplitude of the modulating signal. Modulating index for PM is given as beta is equal to delta phi, where delta phi is the peak phase deviation in radians. Phase modulation and frequency modulation are interchangeable by selecting the frequency response of the modulator. Hence, its output voltage will be proportional to integration and differentiation of the modulating signal respectively. Baseband. In this video, we are going to see about baseband. Baseband. The cable connecting the computer can carry one signal at a time and all the system take turn using it. This type of network is called baseband network.
in the baseband network when a computer transmits data it might be broken into many packets and transmits separately The receiving system reassembles them back into the original. This is called a packet switching network. For example, an audio signal may have a baseband range from 20 to 20,000 Hertz. When it is transmitted on a radio frequency that is RF, it is modulated to a much higher inaudible frequency range. A signal at baseband is usually considered to include frequencies from 0 Hz up to the highest frequency in the signal with significant power. There are few communications media that will pass low frequencies without distortion. Then the original low frequency components are referred to as the baseband signal. For example, a switched analog connection in the telephone network has energy below 300 Hz and above 3400 Hz removed by band pass filtering. Since the signal has no energy very close to zero frequency, it may not be considered a baseband signal. Broadband the term broadband refers to the wide bandwidth characteristics of a transmission medium and its ability to transport multiple signals and traffic types simultaneously. The medium can be coaxial cable, optical fiber, twisted pair, DSL local phone networks or wireless. In contrast, baseband describes a communication system in which information is transported across a single channel. Simplex communication In the broadband, network carries multiple signals in a single cable at the same time. The example of broadband network is cable TV. Half duplex communications. In half duplex communications, two computers communicate over a long data typical travels only in one direction at a time because the baseband network used for most LAN supports only a single signal. This is called half duplex communications. An example of an half duplex communications is two way radio set in which only one part can transmit at any one time and each part must say over to signal. Full duplex communications The two systems that can communicate in both the directions simultaneously are called full duplex mode communication. The most common example of a full duplex network is, once again, the telephone system. Both parts can speak simultaneously during the telephone call and each part can hear the other at the same time. Pulse code modulation that is PCM in this video, we are going to see about pulse code modulation that is PCM. Pulse code modulation is a method by which an audio signal is represented as a digital data. In data communication using computers, audio signals are normally converted into pulse code modulation that is PCM using sampling techniques. These PCM signals can be stored or transmitted as a PCM code. They can also be compressed to reduce the number of bits used to code the samples. PCM generally uses differential coding schemes to encode 
audio and video signals where there is a limited change from one value to the next. PCM refers to a system in which the standard values of a quantized wave are indicated by a series of coded pulses that may be binary consisting of pulses. When these pulses are decoded, they indicate the standard values of the original quantized wave. It is basically concerned with the methods of converting analog wave shapes to digital wave shapes by varying some characteristics of pulses occurring at discrete intervals in accordance with the analog wave. All pulses are of the same height and shape. Thus, PCM is a coding scheme used in digital communication because it is less sensitive to noise. Digital systems tend to be less affected by noise than analog. The main parameters in determining the quality of a PCM system are the dynamic range and the signal to noise ratio that is SNR. Delta Modulation PCM This is already stated that PCM converts analog samples into a digital code. Delta Modulation Technique compares the level of the signal with the previous one and uses a single bit code to represent an analog signal. There are basically two disadvantages associated with this technique. Stop overload, granular noise, adaptive delta modulation PCM. Because of the above two disadvantages, there is always a need to establish a compromise between the smallest and largest size of the step. Using adaptive delta PCM, we can reduce slope, overload and granular noise. In this method, the step size is varied in proportion to the slope of the input signal. The larger the slope, the larger the step size. Differential PCM, that is DPCM. Speed signal has smaller bandwidth and does not have much variation in amplitude. Hence, there is not much variation between two samples. Transmitting the difference in the amplitude of two consecutive samples can reduce this redundancy. Since the range of sample differences is typically less than the range of individual samples, fewer bits are required for DPCM than for conventional PCM. Adaptive Differential PCM that is ADPCM ADPCM allows speech to be transmitted at 32 kilobits per second with little noticeable loss of quality. In DPCM, the difference between the current and previous samples are transmitted. ADPCM uses a uniform sample M, but when the signal moves towards the limits of the quantization range, the step size M is increased. If it is around the center of the ranges, the step size is decreased. Within any other regions, the step size hardly changes. Introduction to Modem Modulation Techniques In this video, we are going to see about Introduction to Modem Modulation Techniques. Communication channels like telephone lines are usually analog media. Analog media is a bandwidth limited channel. 
In the case of telephone lines, the suitable bandwidth falls in the range of 300 Hz to 3300 Hz. Digital information signals have the shape of a pulse and are represented by 0 and 1. If such digital signals were transmitted on analog media, then they will be distorted. These digital signals must be converted into analog signals so that the communication channels can carry the information from one place to another. The technique that enables this conversion is called shift keying or modulation. Shift keying ASK, FSK, PSK, QPSK, DPSK. In this video, we are going to see about shift keying ASK, FSK, PSK, QPSK, DPSK. There are basically following types of modulation used in modems. They are as follows. ASK, Amplitude Shift Keying. FSK, Frequency Shift Keying. PSK, Phase Shift Keying. QPSK, Quadrature Phase Shift Keying. DPSK, Differential Phase Shift Keying. QAM. Quadrature Amplitude Modulation Amplitude Shift Keying ASK Amplitude Shift Keying that is ASK describes a technique by which the carrier wave is multiplied by the digital signal F of T. Mathematically the modulated carrier signal V of T is V of T is equal to F of T sine 2 pi FCT plus pi where FC is a carrier frequency and it is instantaneous time. The main advantage of this technique is that it is easy to produce such signals and also to detect them. This technique has two major disadvantages. The first is that the speed of the changing amplitude is limited by the bandwidth of the line. The second is that the small amplitude changes suffer from unreliable frequency shift keying that is FSK. In this technique, the frequency of the carrier signal is changed according to the data. The transmitter sends different frequencies for a 1 than for a 0 as shown. FSK describes the modulation of a carrier or two carriers by using a different frequency for a 1 or 0. The resultant modulated signal may be regarded as the sum of two amplitude modulated signals of different carrier frequency. Mathematically, the modulated wave Y of T can be shown as Y of T is equal to F1 of T sine 2 pi F T1 T plus phi plus F2 of T into sine 2 pi FT2 T plus phi where FT1 and FT2 are different carrier frequencies of two different signals. FSK is classified as wide band if the separation between the two carrier frequencies is larger than the bandwidth of the spectrums. In this case, the spectrum of the modulated signal appears as two separate amplitude shift keying, that is ASK signals. The disadvantages of this technique are similar to that of amplitude modulation. Phase shift keying, that is PSK. In this modulation method, a sine wave is transmitted and the phase of the sine wave carries the digital data. This technique in order to detect the phase of each symbol, 
requires phase synchronization between the receiver's and transmitter's phase. Differential phase modulation A sub-method of the phase modulation is differential phase modulation. This technique is also called phase shift keying, that is PSK. In this method, the modem shifts the phase of each succeeding signal in a certain number of degrees for a zero, that is 90 degrees for example, and a different certain number of degrees for a one, that is 270 degrees for example. PSK is a technique which shifts the period of a wave. The wave has a period P starting from zero. The wave is the same wave as but its phase has been shifted. This technique of letting each shift of a wave represent some bit value is phase shift keying. PSK describes a modulation technique that alters the phase of the carrier. Mathematically, it can be represented as y of t is equal to f of t sine 2 pi f t plus phi of t. Where pi of t is phase shift. This method is easier to detect than the previous one. The receiver has to detect the phase shifts between symbols and not the absolute phase. Quadrature phase shift keying, that is QPSK. Two data channels modulate the carrier. Transitions in the data cause the carrier to shift by either 90 or 180 degrees. This allows transmission of two discrete data streams identified as I channel in phase and Q channel quadrature data. Differential phase shift keying DPSK. DPSK changes the phase of the carrier wave instead of frequency. This is used for digital transmission in which the phase of the carrier is discreetly varied in relation to the phase of the immediately preceding signal element and in accordance with the data being transmitted. A disadvantage of DPSK is higher BER versus SNR that BPSK by about 1 decibel. Encoding techniques and codec. In this video, we are going to see about encoding techniques and codec. Encoding techniques and codec. Encoding techniques are required that information must be encoded into signals before it can be transported across communication media. In more precise words, we may say that waveform pattern of voltage or current used to represent the ones and zeros of a digital signal on a transmission link is called digital to digital line encoding. There are different encoding schemes available. Digital to digital encoding. It is the representation of digital information by a digital signal. There are basically following types of digital to digital encoding available like unipolar, polar, bipolar, unipolar. Unipolar encoding uses only one level of value 1 as a positive value and 0 remains idle. Since unipolar line encoding has one of its states at 0 volts, it is also called return to 0 that is RT. A common example of unipolar line encoding is the TTL logic levels used in computers and digital logic. Unipolar encoding represents DC that is direct current component and therefore cannot travel through media such as microwaves or transformers. 
it has low noise margin and needs extra hardware for synchronization purposes. It is well suited where the signal path is short. For long distances, it produces stray capacitance in the transmission medium and therefore it never returns to zero. Polar Polar encoding uses two levels of voltages, say positive and negative. For example, the RS232D interface uses polar line encoding. The signal does not return to zero, it is either a positive voltage or a negative voltage. Polar encoding may be classified as non-return to zero, that is NRZ, return to zero, RZ and biphase. NRZ may be further divided into NRZL and NRZI. Biphase has two different categories as Manchester and Differential Manchester encoding. It has the same problem of synchronization as that of unipolar encoding. The added benefit of polar encoding is that it reduces the power required to transmit the signal by one half. Bipolar Bipolar uses three voltage levels. These are positive, negative and zero. Bit zero occurs at zero level of amplitude. Bit one occurs alternatively when the voltage level is either positive or negative and therefore also called as alternate mark inversion that is AMI. There is no DC component because of the alternate polarity of the pulses for once. Codecs, coders and decoders. Codec stands for coders or decompression in data communication. The reverse conversion of analog to digital is necessary in situations where it is advantageous to send analog information across a digital circuit. Certainly, this is often the case in carrier networks where huge volumes of analog voice are digitized and sent across high capacity digital circuits. The device that accomplishes the analog to digital conversion is known as a codec. Codecs are widely used to convert analog voice and video to digital format and to reverse the process on the receiving end. Modem based on range. In this video, we are going to see about modem based on range. Classification of modems. Classification of modems. Range, short haul, voice grade, that is VG, wide band. Line type, dial up, le leased line. Operation mode. Half duplex, full duplex, simplex. Synchronization is asynchronous modems. Synchronous modems. Modem based on range. Short haul. Short haul modems use private lines and are not part of a public system. The transmission rate must be reduced to ensure consistent and error-free transmission on longer distances. There are two main types of short-haul modems. Analog modem. Line drivers. Voice grade, that is VG. Voice grade modems use a moderate to high data rate. 
There is no distance limitation in this case. A terminal to terminal connection may be either dedicated or dialed. Wideband Wideband modems are used in large volume telephone line multiplexing and in dedicated computer to computer links. These modems use high data rates. Modem based on line. Leased line. Leased private or dedicated lines usually for wires or for the exclusive use of leased line modems. It uses either pair in a simple point to point connection or several on a multi drop network for polling or a contention system. Dial up. Dial up modems can establish point to point connections on the PSTN by any combination of manual or automatic dialing or answering. The links established are almost always two wires because a four wire dialing is tedious and expensive. The lines may be combined in a four wire or two wire network, often called a hybrid or a hybrid transformer, at any point in a single path. Modem based on operation mode. Half duplex. Half duplex means that signals can be passed in either direction, but not in both simultaneously. Half duplex modems can work in full duplex mode. Full duplex. Full duplex means that signals can be passed in either direction simultaneously. Full duplex modems will not work on half duplex channels. Simplex Simplex means that signals can be passed in one direction only. A remote modem for a telemetering system might be simplex and a two wire line with a common unidirectional amplifier is simplex. Modems based on synchronization. Asynchronous modems. Most of the modems that operate in slow and moderate rates up to 1800 BPS are asynchronous. They use two frequencies for transmission and another two for receiving. Asynchronous modems can be connected in different options to the communication media. They may use two wire or four wire interface, switch lines or leased lines, interface to call unit or automatic answer when dialing up. Synchronous modems. Synchronous modems operate in the audio range at rates up to 28.8 kbps in audio lines. They are used in the telephone systems. The usual modulation methods are the phase modulation and integrated phase and amplitude modulation at higher rates than 4800 bps. In synchronous modems, equalizers are used in order to offset the mismatch of the telephone lines. These equalizers are inserted in addition to the equalizers that sometimes already exist in the telephone lines. These equalizers can be classified into three main groups as fixed or statistical equalizer, manually adjusted equalizer, 
ऑटोमेटिक इक्वलाइजर स्टैंडर्ड्स एंड प्रोटोकॉल्स इन दिस वीडियो वी आर गोइंग टू सी अबाउट स्टैंडर्ड्स एंड प्रोटोकॉल्स For modems, the standards define techniques used for modulation, for error detection, for data compression, and other attributes. There are some standard organizations for the development of interface standards. Bell one hundred three and two twelve A. These are old standards. Bell 103 transmits at 300 bps at 1 bit per baud. Bell 212A is the next step up, capable of 2 bits per baud. It was capable of 1200 bps at 600 baud. Each used a different type of modulation. V21, V22, V23, V29, V32, V32 BIS, V32 Fast, V34. Data compression involves different methods such as Huffman coding, run length coding, protocols used by modems to transfer files. The widespread protocols for transferring files are X modem, Y modem and Z modem. X modem protocol. This protocol divides the data into blocks. Each block contains a sequence of number of the block, 128 bytes of the data, and 4 bytes of checksum. The protocol on the other side is synchronized. This synchronization takes place by checking the sequence number of currently transferred block and then calculating the checksum of 128 bytes of data and comparing it to the transferred checksum. In the case of error, it requests to send the same block again. Y Modem Protocol In this method, each block contains 1024 bytes. The checksum size is 4 bytes. It is faster than the X Modem Protocol. It may also transfer a batch of files and information about each file to be transferred and its size. This helps a user on the other side to check the time left or the transfer. Z Modem Protocol Z Modem is a public domain program. There are several main advantages of this protocol. The block size varies from 16 to 1024 bytes. The protocol dynamically finds the optimal block size for the file transfer on the current phone line. It starts with a data block size of 1 kilobyte. It reduces automatically in case the phone line is noisy or enlarges the block size when the line disturbance appears. Establishing a connection In this video, we are going to see about establishing a connection. Establishing a connection between two modems involves a handshaking process of sending and receiving coded signals to coordinate the connection. The fallback method is used to find a common way of communication. 
There are two common data interfaces that specify international standards for low-speed data communication. CCITTV24, ELA-RS-232C, RS-232C and RS-449, RS-232C and its successor RS-449 are well-known physical layer protocols and neat descriptions. Whenever possible, the parallel transmission is considered a preferred method of data transfer because of high data transmission rate than serial transmission. This method has also its own drawbacks like susceptibility to noise in case of long distances and bulky size of cable if the number of bits to be transmitted are higher. In the case of serial transmission, as one bit is transmitted at a time, data can be transferred with a simple electrical circuit consisting of only two wires. This scheme therefore reduces the bulk and much of the expense of the parallel transmission technique. RS-232C RS-232 has been around as a standard for decades as an electrical interface between data terminal equipment that is DTE and data circuit terminating equipment that is DCE such as modems or DSUs. It appears under different incarnations such as RS-232C, RS-232D, V24, V28 or V10 but essentially all these interfaces are interoperable. RS-232 is used for asynchronous data transfer as well as synchronous links such as SDLC, HDLC, Frame Relay and X25. There is a standardized pinout for RS-232 on a DB25 connector. Data on pin 2 of the DTE is transmitted while the same data on the pin 2 of a DCE that is modem is received data RS-449. The Electronic Industries Association that is ELA is responsible for developing the RS-449 standard. RS-449 utilizes both balanced and unbalanced circuit types. RS-449 is usually three standards in one. RS-422A specifies the electrical operation for the balanced circuits and RS-423A the unbalanced circuits. The physical layout of all the pins of the DB37 and DB9 respectively. Digital Subscriber Loop that is DSL In this video, we are going to see about Digital Subscriber Loop that is DSL. Digital Subscriber Line that is DSL or Digital Subscriber Loop that is DSL is a type of high-speed internet technology that enables transmission of digital data via the wires of a telephone network. Digital subscriber line that is DSL technology is one of the most promising for support high speed digital communication over the existing telephone. DSL technology is a set of technologies each differing in the first letter that is ADSL, VDSL, HDSL and SDSL. The set is often referred to as XDSL where X can be replaced by A, V, H or S. The first technology in the set is asymmetric DSL that is ADSL. ADSL like a 56K modem provides higher speed that is bit rate in the downstream direction than in the upstream direction. That is the reason it is called asymmetric. using existing local loops. One interesting point is that ADSL uses the existing telephone lines that is local loop. 
The answer is that the twisted pack cable used in telephone lines is actually capable of handling bandwidths up to 1.1 MHz, but the filter installed at the end office of the telephone company where each local loop terminates limits the bandwidth to 4 kHz that is sufficient for voice communication. If the filter is removed, however, the entire 1.1 MHz is available for data and voice communication. Typically, an available bandwidth of 1.104 MHz is divided into a voice channel, an upstream channel, and a downstream channel. ADSL allows the subscriber to use the voice channel and the data channel at the same time. The rate for the upstream can reach 1.44 Mbps. However, the data rate is normally below 500 kbps because of the high level noise in this channel. The downstream data rate can reach 13.4 Mbps. However, the data rate is normally below 8 Mbps because of noise in this channel. A very interesting point is that the telephone company in this case serves as the ISP so services such as email or internet access are provided by the telephone company itself.